Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. So in spite of yet another setback, admittedly because of a ULA rocket, not because of Boeing this time, Starliner is ultimately going to be carrying humans up to orbit very soon. Or at least that's the assumption. But here's the big question, a question I've been asking over and over again. Why do we really need this thing? I mean, we've been expecting Starliner to enter service since 2019, and ever since then, Crew Dragon has been taking care of NASA's ISS transportation needs admirably, and it's been doing it for $35 million less per seat than Boeing is ultimately going to be charging. Why do we need to pay so much more for a spacecraft that clearly is nowhere near as good as Crew Dragon. All of this and more coming at you on the Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon and once again welcome to the Angry Astronaut. I've taken a couple of days away from content creation, at least in terms of releasing videos. The, <laughs> the grind never seems to end when you're a content creator, but nevertheless had to take some time to myself because of a development here in Britain that you are very seldom going to see. Blue sky and sunshine. How about that? So, definitely had to take advantage of that when the opportunity arose. And now I'm back to talking to you folks. This time about something that I haven't discussed in a while. And that's Starliner. Something that I've been trying to, a topic I've been trying to get to lately, simply because it's something, well, something I've been talking about since I started this channel. Indeed, the first episode that I ever released, which was entitled, Who's Ripping Us Off Worse, NASA and Boeing or Vladimir Putin? Well, that was actually about Starliner and how much Starliner was going to be charging per seat to take astronauts up to the ISS versus how much the Russians charged on Soyuz. And that situation hasn't changed at all. It's still going to be $90 million per seat with Starliner and $85 million with the Soyuz. So, Ironically, because Starliner has been delayed for so long, for all of these years, that's actually saved the American taxpayer tens of millions of dollars because astronauts have been traveling exclusively on Crew Dragon instead of on Starliner. So, of course, this begs the question, why the hell do we need Starliner? I mean, is there anything about it that's particularly useful that's worth all the extra money? Because SpaceX, they only charge $55 million per seat to NASA. Once again, Boeing charging $90 million. So for that extra $35 million, what sort of value is Boeing actually providing to NASA and to the U.S. taxpayer? Is there any benefit at all? Is all this time invested? Is all of this effort really worth it? And once Starliner actually does get into service, and there's no guarantee that that's actually going to happen, at least not safely, is it going to bring any benefit to NASA whatsoever? So first of all, let's quickly review how Starliner gets into space, because it's actually a bit different than Crew Dragon. Well, significantly different. First of all, of course, it rides on the Atlas V. This is going to be one of the final flights for Atlas V, although it will be in service for some time, because it is the only human-rated rocket, at least currently, that ULA has at its disposal. The RD-180 engines that power this rocket represent the pinnacle of Russian rocket technology. These engines have over 800,000 pounds of thrust at sea level and over 900,000 pounds of thrust in a vacuum, which is substantially more than even the Raptor 3. 
ULA is really going to miss these engines, but once again, the U.S. Congress made the decision that they didn't want NASA to be dependent on Russian technology anymore, which is a pretty good idea. So, once the solid rocket boosters are jettisoned, and once the primary stage runs out of fuel, then the rocket weighs less than 9% of what it weighed at takeoff. But we need to get introduced to a few modifications made to the Atlas V to make the Starliner safe for a human crew, because frankly, this thing is a bit of a death trap. What you saw right there is a shield or a sheath that's put over the nose cone of the Starliner, which makes it more aerodynamic, because frankly, this thing didn't perform very well in a wind tunnel. And in a second, you're also going to see the aerodynamic skirt on the Centaur upper stage. Just saw it right there eject away. And the reason that's there is once again because the Starliner was not a very aerodynamic vehicle. It had its issues and ULA had to implement these changes in order to make it safe. And there's something else that ULA does that SpaceX does not. Do you see how shallow that trajectory is? The reason ULA keeps the trajectory for Starliner looking that way is to make it easy to carry out an abort off the coast of Africa. Believe it or not, in spite of all of these modifications, ULA does not have a tremendous amount of confidence in Starliner, and therefore they had to make these sorts of modifications to the trajectory, not terribly different than the trajectory that was used for the space shuttle, in order to ensure the safety of the astronauts. The Crew Dragon ascends far more vertically than Starliner does. So, once again, the question is, is there anything about this spacecraft that's any good that makes it worth the time and the investment? Well, Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams took the time to show us around the low-fidelity version of Starliner to introduce us to some of the features of the spacecraft. Frankly, I don't see a whole lot of advantages, but nevertheless, if you look a little deeper, the advantages become a bit more apparent. Number one, the controls on this space spacecraft are much better when it comes to manual override, something that isn't very well suited to an untrained space tourist, but to a professional astronaut who needs to carry out a manual override if there's some sort of significant systems failure, there's a lot more traditional piloting type equipment old style, low fidelity type of equipment on this spacecraft that simply doesn't exist on Crew Dragon. Crew Dragon is much more point and click. So that could be a bit of an advantage if there's some sort of an emergency. Another advantage is that this spacecraft can set down on land. The inflatable skirts, once you jettison the heat shield anyway, allow Starliner to set down in white sands or just about any other appropriate retrieval area, which makes it less expensive and less complicated to retrieve the crew as opposed to an oceanic landing. Those are always a lot more difficult and a lot more problematic, especially given the fact that you can't predict ocean storms and ocean wave conditions, that sort of thing, even though for the most part there's never really been a problem with Crew Dragon with that type of recovery, it really does simplify matters considerably if you can carry out a land-based recovery. And unlike the extremely rough landings that Taikonauts and Cosmonauts experience, because of these inflatable skirts, the Starliner landing is a lot more gentle and a a lot more similar to an oceanic landing. Not exactly the same, at least as far as we know. Once again, no astronauts have traveled on this thing, so everything is pretty experimental and theoretical at this point. All we can do is hope that things go smoothly. And there's one other advantage that Starliner brings to the table. Starliner is capable of reboosting the ISS. It has powerful enough 
maneuvering thrusters, especially all of the engines on its service module. I mean, we're talking a vast number of engines here. 28 RCS engines, another 20 engines designed for attitude control, and then another dozen engines on the capsule itself, which orient the vehicle while it's performing re-entry. By the way, it's these thrusters that experienced a lot of challenges during the last test. There are quite a number of thruster failures the last time, any one of which could have theoretically caused problems with the re-entry and therefore the safety of the crew. However, redundancy kicked in and not enough engines failed to cause a significant problem. Nevertheless, just another issue in the innumerable list of problems with this spacecraft that have reared their ugly heads over the years. Software problems, fire potential with its wiring system. I mean, there are so many issues with this spacecraft. No less than 80 corrective actions during its first failure, let alone the subsequent issues that this spacecraft had afterwards, issues that were not completely rectified when Boeing and NASA were prepared to carry out a manned mission over a year ago. It took the intervention of an independent review board who essentially blew the whistle on the outstanding problems that were still lingering with this spacecraft that prevented Boeing and NASA from rolling the dice yet again with astronauts' lives unnecessarily. I mean, I can understand if this was the only alternative that we had with Soyuz and we had to take these kinds of chances in order to give access to the ISS and not essentially turn it over to the Russians, but that's not the case. But still, don't we need an alternative to Crew Dragon? Are we not one disaster away from being cut off from the ISS again? Well, yes and no. As you're seeing right now, and as I'm sure you can probably guess, I'm going to suggest that the Sierra Space Dream Chaser, at least the human-rated version, which is scheduled to come online sometime in 2026, is going to be able to provide everything that Starliner can and a whole lot more. This thing is capable of performing ISS reboost. It's capable of setting down not just on flat land in a test range, but rather on any airfield that has a long enough runway, that is to say a runway that's capable of accommodating a full-size commercial airliner. And not only that, a spacecraft that has substantially less G-forces when it's carrying out a re-entry, a spacecraft that's completely reusable, a spacecraft that NASA should have selected at the beginning of the commercial crew process rather than going with Boeing's overpriced and deeply flawed piece of garbage. The Sierra Space Dream Chaser in a couple of years is going to provide everything that Starliner will and it will completely replace and supplant the Boeing capsule in every significant respect. There will be no reason whatsoever to have Starliner once Dream Chaser is in service, which means Starliner may be relevant for a couple of years but not a whole lot longer than that. Thank you very much for watching. I would like to thank Carlton Little for becoming my latest Patreon supporter. Thank you very much. The closer I get to that 1% threshold, the more I'm going to be able to do with this channel and the more I'm going to be able to travel to launches in person and bring you a lot more quality content. So thank you very much. And if you'd like to join this growing group of supporters, all the details are in the description. Please like, please subscribe, and as always, stay angry about space.